From that, uh, I want to talk about KDAS. This is a target which is common in lung cancer. 25% approximately of adenocarcinoma patients have it, but we've not had successful targeted therapy options. Pasi, can you talk a little bit about KRAS biology, why it's been hard to find a targeted strategy for that particular subset? Yeah, so as you mentioned, KRAS is about 20, 25% of lung adenocarcinomas, and about half of those are the uh, KRAS G12C uh, mutations, which are most common in lung cancers and all of cancer. And um, really, it's been a challenge uh, to find uh, targeted therapies. KRAS is not a kinase like the other molecular targets that we talked about. Uh, and finding a drug that can outcompete the cellular uh, affinity for uh, GTP has been uh, quite difficult. I think the big breakthrough here came a few years ago with the identification of potentially a drug that can covalently bind KRAS, and that's why they work for the G12C. So osimertinib is a covalent inhibitor, also binds a cysteine. Uh, these uh, new drugs like the AMG510 is also a covalent inhibitor and binds a cysteine, and I think opens the possibility that we will uh, be able to have uh, targeted therapies finally for KRAS mutant patients. If you go back and look at all of our pie charts that we present, KRAS has been there uh, for a very long period of time, and it, yet it's only now that uh, we're able to do something about it. So the data that's uh, uh, been presented at the WCLC meeting on, on the AMG 510, which is the, uh, one of the KRAS G12C inhibitors, is certainly very exciting. There was approximately a 50% response rate in patients with G12C mutant, uh, uh, KRAS mutant cancer. Uh, it was, drug was well tolerated because it's a highly specific drug and, and technically shouldn't have uh, uh, off-target effects. I think it's really an exciting time for KRAS mutant lung cancer. This is the big one that, uh, at least in the, in, in the U.S., we see in the clinic. Uh, it's the biggest chunk of the pie, and I think if we can start to make impact here, it'll have real, real clinical uh, significance not just for lung cancer, but for the other cancers that have KRAS G12C mutations, but lung is really the big one. So, Johan, can you talk about how you view the AMG510? Pasi obviously uh, talked about uh, his level of enthusiasm. Yeah. Tell well, us the, about yours. The, the, one of the nice things is that many people in Europe, as I told you, do sequencing at the DNA level. So you usually detect KRAS, so you know it baseline. That's the first good thing, and you know it's the G12C. And um, KRAS has been a problem child for over decades, and it's a big piece of the molecular pie, as, as just has been said. So any progress there would be very welcome because it will be the case, at least in the Western world, for a large proportion of patients, larger than the EGFR fraction. And so, yes, if they have a response in about half of the patients with that drug, it's very early data, but it's most encouraging. One thing uh, that I want to comment on uh, AMG510 is that it only targeting uh, G12C. So uh, in uh, Asian uh, countries, we often see non-G12C KRAS mutation because most of KRAS mutation in uh, Asian countries is, uh, is occur in never smoker population. So we often see G12D and G12V uh, KRAS mutation that uh, cannot, which cannot be targeted by uh, AMG 510. That is uh, most uh, most of our concern in e Asian countries. Yeah, I, I'm, ho I'm hoping that the enthusiasm from what we're seeing so far targeting G12C will open up more interest in developing newer right. therapies for the other KRAS mutants. I think people had struggled with KRAS targeted therapies for a long period of time, and there's a, a nice history of failures, and I think having successes will drive uh, additional enthusiasm for, uh, uh, for the other KRAS mutants. Based on this discussion about the KRAS molecular prevalence and the AMG510 data, should oncologists be routinely getting patients' KRAS status moving forward right now, or is that something they would hold off until we have an FDA approval? Well, I think uh, if you do molecular testing as part of a panel, it'll come anyway, um, so that, that's a good thing. Um, the second reason to test it would be potentially to enroll patients onto the clinical trials, uh, if you have access to those trials, given the preliminary data that we've seen so far. But routine, outside of that, if you have no access to a trial, probably not yet, but, uh, but maybe we'll be one of the next ones to uh, uh, be uh, uh, a tar target that we test for routinely. So as we wind down the year 2019, is it fair to say that as we think about what are the exciting advances we look forward to in 2020, uh, looking at expanded data sets with AMG510 and also some of the other KRAS G12C inhibitors, 
belongs right on the top of the list? Absolutely. I think, I think uh, we're seeing, uh, uh, we saw more at WCLC than we did at, uh, at ASCO. We'll continue to see, I'm sure, more data uh, coming. And I think it'll be seeing what the denominator is, what is the durability of the response, why do some KRAS mutant patients respond and others don't. I think all the same questions that we had in other targeted therapy fields will continue to apply here as well. But I think it's an exciting time. Great. And uh, last topic we want to discuss in the realm of targeted therapies is uh, the issue of molecular testing. We saw the results from the BFAS trial where uh, they had done peripheral blood-based ctDNA NGS testing, and Dr. Gadgil presented results at the, World, uh, at the ESMO Congress, and he showed that in over 2,200 patients that underwent testing in the blood, they were able to detect ALK in about 5% of the patients, and these patients were treated with electinib, and the response rate was 87%. So the results from the blood identify a patient subset that derives this, practically the same amount of benefit that you would have expected from tissue-based testing. Uh, is this one more step towards routine incorporation of peripheral blood testing in our frontline algorithm? Well, um, in general, we have the policy to have a baseline to try to have tissue as much as possible in, in as many uh, patients as possible. In the European context, and it's in contrast to some other regions, we use quite a lot of um, um, cell blocks because about one third of the diagnosis comes from EBS and other samples. But, so if you take that into account that you use these samples and there are no sufficient data to say you can do re reliable immunotesting, you can do reliable targeted therapy testing on these type of samples, then I think if you take, if you take these uh, cell blocks together with the biopsies, the majority of the patients will still have a biopsy at baseline. But we discussed it for EGFR. Obviously, it's, it's welcome in patients where it's difficult to get a biopsy. If you, do, can, if you can do something reliable on plasma that leads you to a targeted therapy, it is a plus. 